Good morning. This is worship for First Presbyterian Church in Pilot Mountain. And I want to say Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Basically, I would like for you to call your mom, or one who has been like a mother to you. But to all those who have not been mothers, who would like to be mothers, I would like to say that you too are celebrated today. Also, our Galatians Bible study is this week at 7.30 on Wednesday. Uh, there is a Zoom link out sent out on uh, the first email. Uh, the assignment for this week is Galatians 3.19 through 4.11 so that we can all join together with the text and, and begin study there. If you would join me now in our call to worship printed in your bulletin. Let us offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. The scripture tells us that if we say we have no sin, we are found to be lying and God is not with us. So let us join together and confess our sins to God and to one another with our unison prayer of confession. Almighty God, your word offers freedom from sin, but we confess that we have not obeyed your word. We have harbored malice toward our enemies. We have been deceitful in our relationships. We have been insincere in our commitments. Through gossip, we have slandered our friends. Forgive us our sins and lead us to genuine repentance. Help your children long for your pure spiritual milk that we may grow into the joy of salvation through Jesus Christ. Amen. Siblings in Christ, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Hear and believe the good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And if you would join me now in our unison prayer for illumination. Lord, as we listen to your holy word, open our hearts to the power of your spirit, call us out of darkness, and lead us into your marvelous light. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from Psalms 31, verses 1 through 5 and 15 through 16. Listen now to the word of the Lord. In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Do not let me be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. You are indeed my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that is hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O God, O Lord, faithful God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and persecutors. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. And from John 14, verses 1 to 14. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know that the way, that the place that I am going, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, 
show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. And our second reading this morning comes from the letter of 1 Peter, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Rid yourselves, therefore, of all malice and all guile, insincerity, envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner, and a stone that makes them stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There are times when the lectionary throws a curveball at the preacher. Sometimes, like last week, a key verse is left out and it is up to the preacher whether or not to add the verse. Other times, like this week, it jumps backwards. Now most of the time, when we read scripture, it is in a linear fashion. We begin with the text and we continue to read what comes after that text. Easy and, well, let's just face it, just the way things should be. However, this week's text takes us back in the second chapter of First Peter to the very beginning. And why this is done, I, I have no idea. But it is what it is, and so we continue with 1 Peter. Now last week I gave a little bit of background to 1 Peter, and today I would like to give a little bit more to flesh out what is happening in the text for today. Now the author is writing to the diaspora community from a place known as Babylon. Now for those who knew their First Testament scriptures, they would understand right away what this meant. Diaspora meant to a community not in its own homeland, i.e. Israel. And Babylon was, of course, the nation that had caused that diaspora. Babylon was long gone now, but there was a place that caused oppression and scattered groups of people in the ancient Mediterranean. It was Rome. And so this letter is thought to have been written from Rome to communities outside of the area who were coming under some hostility and harassment. Well, why would these communities be coming under harassment, you might ask? And most of them were good citizens, ethical, never causing trouble, members of the local business associations, think the Rotary Club, 
and all around good neighbors. But there were a couple of things in this group, the Christians, in the, that the, they did in different communities. In a world where everyone was expected to give some kind of reverence to the emperor, the Christians did not. They did not offer sacrifices to Roma, the patron goddess of Rome. They did not participate in the festivals that were part of the social fabric of Roman society. And this would have put them at odds socially and politically. In a world where family and social standing were considered all important, even more so than money and power, these people would be seen as not loyal to the empire, not loyal to the welfare of the state and community, and going against the social norms in a society where nonconformity was frowned upon. And so, the community in which they lived would have viewed them with suspicion and derision. The Christians would likely have been blamed for crop failures and bad weather, poor birth rates in both animals and humans, Anything that would cause hardship in the community would be blamed on these Christians because they had abandoned the old ways and were not upholding the fabric of society. Roma was punishing the community, and so the community needed to punish those who were bringing the hardships on them. Probably the closest parallel today would be how the Jews have been treated throughout history, and even to this day, after Rome became a Christian empire, or more recently, Quakers or Anabaptists. And to us, this seems really strange, as nonconformity is applauded in our society. Isn't it? Think about that for a bit. But the fact that they were bucking the norms would have caused harassment, confusion, and heartbreak for the Christians as families are torn apart, friendships destroyed, business contracts ended. And into the mix of all these issues comes the letter of 1 Peter. Now the people are being told that they are to rid themselves of who they once were and are to long for the pure spiritual milk that will nourish them and help them grow into new Christians and, and continue to grow. But the main thrust of the text comes in verses 4 through 10. Those to whom the letter is addressed are told that Jesus too was rejected. He was the cornerstone of the new temple and was rejected by those who were not chosen by God as a flawed stone. But to those who were called by God to have faith, the ones listening to this letter, Jesus is the cornerstone chosen by God just as they were chosen. The cornerstone of any building is the key to the strength and stability of that building. If there is a flaw in the stone, then the whole building will not be stable and will come falling down. This community is told that they are now to be living stones, part of a temple built on the unflawed, the flawless cornerstone of Christ, part of a priesthood that brings sacrifices and praises to God for what God has done for them through Jesus Christ. This is language that even Gentile followers would understand. In a society where there were temples all around and sacrifices made every day, they knew what was being said. And Peter then begins to quote scripture. Now my classmates and I were told in seminary that we needed to know the first or Old Testament as well as we knew the second or New Testament because without the first, we would not understand the second. Now those who wrote the Second Testament knew the first because those were the only scriptures that they had. And so when Peter wants to make clear his point that Jesus was the one rejected yet chosen, that those who put faith in him would not be put to shame, that those who did reject him would stumble and fall, he quotes Isaiah and the Psalms, the Shakespeare and the hymnal of the First Testament. But the most powerful scriptures are, pay, are saved for last. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, 
but now you have received mercy. These are from verses 9 and 10. Verse 9 is alluding to and quoting Exodus 19.5-6 as well as others. And it is here that God is telling the Israelites that they have been chosen, called out to proclaim the acts of God. They are to be a special people, one who gives proclamation, testimony of what God has done, as well as praise to what God has done. Now verse 10 is quoting Hosea 1, 6, 9, and 2, 23. It is a section where God has told Hosea to name his children, one named No Mercy and one named Not My People. It's telling the community from 1 Peter that this community, where they once were nothing, now they are God's people. Once, and probably currently, they had received no mercy, but now they receive the mercy of God. And they are to hold each other and remember what God has done for them. And in doing so, they will be able to withstand the storm of persecution that is all around them. Today we read these words and we wonder how they speak to us. In the United States, we are not under persecution. And we may hear commentators go on about how Christians are under persecution, just like the days of the Roman Empire. We are not. We do not have to fear to go to our churches when there is not a pandemic, of course. We can and are even encouraged to broadcast our services online and on television. Many people have In God We Trust on their license plates. And the list goes on and on and on. We are not persecuted. There are places in the world where there are truly persecutions for being a Christian. And we need to pray for and support our siblings in Christ in those areas. But how do we in the United States, how do we today apply those texts to our lives? The book entitled Text for Preaching submits several ways to apply this text to today. First, it is to remember that we are living stones that make up a temple that is built on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. Now, this temple or this house is made up of all kinds of different stones, different households, different races, different socioeconomic positions, different political affiliations, those who are dispossessed. Any of those to whom it once was said, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. The second, we are a community in Jesus Christ. Now this is not to be a social club for those who make the cut that we impose. It is a spiritual house that is to meet the needs of those who are built into the community whose head is God with Jesus as the cornerstone. We must remember that there is nothing that we have done to become a part of this house. God builds the house. God lays the cornerstone. The house is known and accepted or rejected by its cornerstone. And by virtue of God's own mercy and nothing else, the household made of living stones comes into being. And finally, with our recognition of one another and as members of the house of God, we have a new standing in our lives and in the eyes of God. And because of our being living stones in the house of God, we must never, ever condemn, slight, or reject anyone who has been called by God to be a part of this household based on anything that is human understanding. Racial, social, ethnic, anything. They are a part of the household. They are a part of the living stones based on the cornerstone. And we are to welcome and uphold those. To do otherwise, would be to reject the cornerstone and stumble with those who did not believe. So let us go out and be the living stones of the house, the temple, built on the one who is the living 
and sometimes rejected cornerstone. Amen. Our affirmation of faith today is the Apostles' Creed. So join me now in stating what we believe in our baptismal creeds. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. If you have your bulletin, you can turn to page 6 for our prayers of the people, our prayer list. And I ask that you continue to remember those who are in health care, those who are in government trying to make the decisions about what to do, for those who are sick, and for those who are at home wondering what is going to happen next. And so, let us now unite our hearts in prayer, saying, when I say God of resurrection, you would say, hear our prayer. Let us pray. For the church throughout the world, that all who profess to honor the risen Lord may be faithful to their witness and courageous in their testimony to the way of Jesus. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. For pastors, teachers, and ministers during this time, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, they may seek to build the church upon Christ, the cornerstone, and humbly lead in faithful service, even in times of distress and uncertainty. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. For the governments of the world and its leaders, especially in these times with our president, with our governor, with our mayors, with our councils, let us have nations that dwell in peace. Let us have good prevail over strife. Let us have people of faith freely worship as their hearts direct. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. For rain and sun in proper measure and for abundant food and water for all who dwell on the earth. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. For the sick and those in need, and for any who are oppressed by wounds of the soul, God of resurrection, hear our prayer. For our neighbors, that we may live together in harmony, and that strangers among us may find us to be hospitable friends, the living stones built together in a household of faith. God of resurrection, hear our prayers. For our enemies, that their sins may be forgiven them, and that they may find your peace. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. Almighty God, your Son promised to grant whatever we ask in his name. By your Holy Spirit, empower us to minister to the world as his faithful disciples, that our work may testify to what we pray and show forth your eternal glory. Through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hear now the charge for this day. 
May you see Christ in everyone you meet. And may everyone you meet see Christ in you. And until we meet again, may Jesus Christ the way, the truth, and the life be with you. May the Spirit empower you to serve in Christ's name. May God, who raised Christ from the dead, keep you now and forevermore. Amen.